Welcome to the Zach's Roundtable Review, a discussion of current events affecting investors as well as other topics of financial interest featuring the analysts and editors of Zacks.com. Well, rising interest rates haven't derailed the stock market rally, not yet anyway, but have they begun impacting stocks nonetheless? We're going to try and get that answer from our senior stock strategists, Jared Levy and Kevin Cook, and our ETF strategist, Eric Dutram. And I ask that question because, you know, we've always been conditioned into seeing this inverse relationship between rising interest rates and stocks that, uh, that fall. Maybe of late there's been a little bit more of a, a, a more positive correlation between the two. I don't know. I'll let you guys tell me that. But, Jared, how long can stocks go ahead and absorb these higher rates without uh, any negative impact? It, it, this is a tough question to answer. There's a lot of moving parts. I think the focus for now, at least for me, has, has been the 10-year. You know, I'm going to be watching the 10-year. Uh, I think once that starts to, you know, get up above three and three and a half, which I think going to reach potentially by next year, I think at that point you start to see a lot of flows out of stocks back into, you know, sort of the bond market. Because when you look at it, right, like the average dividend yield in terms of safety, volatility, I think a lot of this market fuel comes from, you know, the lack of yield anywhere else and the lack of an investment anywhere else. And again, I think that 10-year goes to 3.5. I think it happens next year. And I think that's the thing you need to watch for market movement uh, lower. Okay, basically we have a little bit more time left. But Kevin Cook... So sounds like a lot more time. Kevin Cook, you say <laughs> that uh, rising rates have already begun hurting some stocks. Yeah, we saw the impact last week with the home builders. We had a lot of reports, a lot of good earnings from from some names there, and uh, but these stocks had already been beaten down from their May highs, uh, below their 50-day moving averages, below their, you know, threatening their 200-day. Mm -hmm. And the shorts were just piling on and it's this theme of, oh my gosh, you know, rates have ramped up here. Yeah, it's been a big percentage move from, you know, 2% to 2.5% on the 10-year. Mm -hmm. And that's bumped the 30-year mortgage above 4%. But, you know, my thesis is, is if we can't handle a little bit of normalization on the yield curve now, mm -hmm. you know, just to, you know, just get, getting back to normal right. from, from very low rates, then you know, what does that say about the future? What does that say about six months, 12 months from now? Because rates, as Jared said, are going to be much higher. Right. The 30, if the 10 year is above 3%, that's going to push the 30 year above 4.5%. Right. Right. And, you know, we're in, we're in a strong housing recovery. And, you know, this muddle through economy is strong enough that we could actually see some, some animal spirits and some momentum to see 25 to 3% GDP next year. Mm -hmm. If we can't handle the rising rates now, then we're in, we're in trouble. So I think this is, short sellers have piled on the home builders as one example mm -hmm. of where you're seeing the impact, but uh, this too will pass. And uh, you know, I've still, I still see S&P 1800 before 1400 okay. uh, in the next 12 months. And that's just based on economic momentum uh, stocks not overvalued, and as Jared pointed out, it, you know it's the best asset class on the planet right now relative mm -hmm. to everything else. I he brings up a good point. He does. I mean, my concern is more of the exponential change that could happen, right? So, like you saw, like in mortgage rates, for instance, perfect example. You know, there, there wasn't any change in federal funds rate. Just sort of talk about you know the tapering slowing down. You had you know the average thirty-year loan go from you know whatever three to almost five percent, right? Now think about this: on a thirty-year mortgage at one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Every percentage point jump is a hundred dollar bump in in that cost of that mortgage, a hundred fifty thousand dollar mortgage. So at a point, it begins to sort of impact things, and I could see where the house, you know, the housing uh, issue. I, I just my concern is when tapering does. Ha begin to happen, and when they do say, "Hey, we're going to," you know, this is when we're going to really begin to, to uh, raise rates. I mm -hmm. think the jump becomes exponential, and I think what I mean by exponential is you go from now. You know, a five percent mortgage, which is pretty rel relatively high, up to seven or eight percent very mm -hmm. quickly, and I think Whoa, that immediately that's stops not things. that's not happening for years. We're not even at five percent now. So yeah, know, we are. Oh yes, we the, are. The average thirty-year mortgage is already at five percent. Four, four and three eighths. And if you have if you have any dings on your credit, you're up at five. I have a buddy of mine right now. He's he's paying a point and getting five. It's a I condo. Mean, the Fed isn't going to let that happen. The Fed is going to be here to make sure mortgage rates don't go to seven and eight percent, as you said. I want to wow. get back to the Fed in just a minute. I want to get Eric in here. Eric, you think that REITs and utilities are also already? Yeah, being I, I kind of agree with what Kevin started to say at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> With the, uh, if you look at XLU, a popular dividend ETF, uh, utility ETF, mm -hmm. it's higher dividend yield, and this one's also been kind of hit once the uh, the rates have moved higher. And same with the REIT space, which kind of you know goes nicely with what Kevin was saying about the 
the regular uh, mortgage sector. Mm -hmm. And also if you look at mortgage REITs, these are obviously the most sensitive of all to right. the, the issues at play. And these have also been dinged down a lot in the past couple of weeks. So, you know, I, I think we're already starting to see some impact, but, you know, I do kind of uh, agree with what Kevin was saying at the end as well about, you know, the Fed will probably be around for a little while longer. I, I, got, a, I got a question. Keep these rates I, down. I agree with that, but I, I have a question with the two of you. Okay, so we know that a bulk of the inventory that's being gobbled up right now is being done so by hedge funds, mostly, mostly in the multifamily space, right? So, and, and they have sort of a cost to carry, and they're also going to look at their exit strategies. Like, the cap rates, in other words, what you would get if you, you know, buy a house and rented it out, they're not that high right now, relatively speaking, right? Because you know, home prices have risen back up. Anyway, point being, if rates do go up 1% or 2%, are the hedge funds still going to be there to sort of support this market? Do you think I, they're going to be there? I, I don't think the hedge funds are supporting the housing market. Yeah, Blackstone created a $13 billion fund last year, and they, they sped up their purchases mm -hmm. in, in, uh, you know, in the past six months. But they're not, I don't think they're, they're driving the housing market here. You know, I think that you've got, I mean, I know they're buying existing family homes. I don't know how many new homes they're buying, so right. I don't know that breakdown. Right. But you've, you've still got low supply, you know, that's not keeping up with household formation. And, you know, the trend is positive. So, yeah, there's a speculative bid because if, if the hedge funds come in, Blackstone comes in, then that forces all the smaller buyers to scramble and buy stuff with cash. I, you know, I think you're going to see some ebb and flow there, but the, the trend is still positive. I agree. The, uh, the average guy is really into the whole housing sector, not so much stocks. If you talk to the average person on the street, you know, they're not really into the whole stock market rally. They're back, you know, trying to get back into housing again. <laughs> and I think this kind of goes which, nicely with what Kevin was saying. Which could be a problem, you know, I yeah, guess 2007, road, 2008, yeah. right? And you have all these apartments now. Rent rates are at historical highs. I'm just letting you guys hash out. <laughs> <laughs> rent, rate are, rent rates are at historical highs. Remember, those, those investors have to convert those eventually yeah. to houses. Uh, they're going to want to. That's their exit strategy. And when they go to sell them they're, and they see rates rising, they're going to be forced to sell them maybe quicker if rates begin to increase sharply. Again, right. I agree. It's speculation. Just some thoughts. I want to get back to, uh, to the Fed. Kevin mentioned the Fed uh, a short time ago. They meet again this week. Yeah. Aha. So does anybody here expect uh, any kind of tweaks to the policy statement? No, because the Fed is not going to be, uh, regardless of what a lot of people think, they're not going to be the market's puppet. They're not going to say, oh, we were just kidding about tapering. They're, they're sort of the market's puppet. Uh, you know, they're, they're not gonna, <laughs> the Fed's not going to trade here and, and, uh, and, and appear wishy-washy. They're going to, they're gonna, I mean, they, they've had a measured moves all along. You know, you fire a big gun of QE mm -hmm. and you give it time to work and you don't expect the ship to turn around immediately. It's a long, slow process. They, you know, they healed the banks. Housing's working now. Now they want the jobs to come back. So they've had to play with the tapering language just to get the market to understand. It's, about, it's more about transparency than getting the, the stock market to go up and down or to assuage, uh, you know, hedge funds, algos, and day traders. But don't yeah. you think they have to do Still. something sooner rather than later in order to keep their credibility with, you know, everyone in the market? No, because their credibility is... But how long can they talk about tapering without actually, you know, doing, doing some it? tapering? It's, it's a dialogue. <laughs> it's trying Probably as to, long as they want. Yeah, I guess so. They're, they're not going back and forth on tapering. It's the market. It's all the dialogue. It's all the chatter. That's, the that's Fed is yeah, trying to say, hey, we want to prepare you for the fact that we think economic growth could be stronger than we expected, and that would mean that at some point we're going to pare back purchases. The, they're, the Fed isn't going back and forth uh, on, their, on their basic policy. It's, the, it's all the chatter you hear around it. Okay, I'm going to give you the last word. Anything else to add on the Fed this week? No, no, no. no. Okay. Kevin, Kevin did a good job. Wise move. And I agree, with, I agree with Kevin, actually. All right. Another Turn spirited conversation here at the roundtable. <laughs> now, we have some stock picks that they want you to be aware of, too. That comes in our next segment.